There was a big debate recently because one of the schools, um, I think it was in Birmingham, an Islamic school, the courts have now ruled that they can no longer have separate classes for the students, girls and boys. And I, I want to show you how disingenuous, how dishonest, how tricky these people are. Because there are, right now in the UK, numerous schools which are single-sex schools, right? Standard, and the arguments for single-sex education are very, very well-developed arguments. And they're very reasoned, and they are very logical when you understand that the primary reason for why single-sex education was developed was because it's a well-known fact that where you have young boys and young girls together in an environment, it can be somewhat distracting to the opposite sex to be sitting next to a girl or sitting next to a boy when you are a girl or a boy. It's better when you are trying to educate young people that you keep them separate because they are be better able to focus. This is the long, long, long established, I think Eton is a, a boys school, right? And there, like I said, there are many, many um, of the top schools which are male or female. And these students have gone on to become some of the movers and shakers on the planet and there is no evidence to suggest that because they came up in an all boys environment or an all girls environment that somehow that ill affected their ability to then form relationships at a later stage in the form of building families and marrying or whatever. There is no such evidence. But all of a sudden, an Islamic school is targeted in the Midlands and they are taken to court by Ofsted and the court ultimately, because there was a lot of to and fro in, I think initially the school won the case, but then Ofsted appealed and then the appeal court overturned the ruling of the first court and then ultimately the ruling is that the school unlawfully sexually discriminated against girls within the school by having separate classes. But the thing I want you to look at more so than anything in this thing that we're talking about today is the language that has been used by almost everybody who is postulating this particular argument. Because there's a particular language that they're using. Now, we're taught, and I'm sure you will all agree with me, that in a dysfunctional marriage, where let's say for argument's sake, the husband is an abuser, the woman is always encouraged by those who love and care about her to separate from that man. Leave him. Ultimately, get a divorce. In the word separation, there is no implication of superior and inferior. In fact, the term separate and equal has been coined because separate just means that you separate two things. When a man and a woman separates, they go their separate ways and one may end up in a flat, the other one may end up in a house, or they both may end up in different apartments, or they may end up in a different part of the country or a different part of the world, but it's just the separation. Separation is natural. 
And so having a separate class for a girl and a separate class for a boy does not imply that one is superior and one is inferior. But the language that has been used in the media, and I noticed, you know, it's very, very consistent language. Everybody is using this word segregation. Not separation, but segregation. And I was thinking to myself, why are they saying that? Because it's not a segregated environment. It is a separated environment. Separate class for girls, separate class for boys. Both parties are equal. The idea of the separation is to allow the students maximum focus on their education, not on one another. But why are you saying segregation? Because segregation is what was done to us. See, segregation implies a superior and an inferior. Ghettos are created based on segregation. Where the powers that be relegate or segregate people to a particular place. That's your place over there. Black people were segregated to the back of the bus. Black people were segregated in that we can't use this toilet facility. We can't use this bathroom facility. We can't drink from this tap. This tap is reserved for whites. Blacks have to drink from that dirty one over there. That's segregation. But why are you using and continuously they use this term segregation over and over and over again now when it comes to anything that these Islamic schools are trying to do in terms of the separate nature of the male and the female. That's a, that's a lie that has been deliberately inserted into the program. But then, you know, I, you know, I do despair, to be completely honest with you, over the fact that sometimes I listen to arguments about religion and I listen to debates about such things as what we're discussing here and some of the so-called spokespeople who pop up to defend the school and or the religion I think my god is that the best that we could find because it's like they got uh, they haven't got a clue it's like they don't know language I mean I'm not a scholar I already went to school, but I do know the difference between separation and segregation, for God's sake. That's a very important distinction there. And to allow these people to see, because what they do, they just keep saying it. See, just, just by saying segregation, there is a negative connotation. Separation is completely different, beloved. And you have to force these people to use the right language because they're the author of their own language. That's right. They know what it means That's right. and they know why they're using segregation. Absolutely. It's not segregation. We don't deal with segregation in Islam. Segregation implies that the female is being discriminated against. That is not the purpose of the separate nature of the sexes within Islam. We don't deal with that. And you all know that this is something that you hear on a constant basis about Islam, that the women are relegated to some second class citizenry within Islam. And the women are forced to walk behind the men 10 paces. We've all heard this, right? Yes, sir. Well, I, you know, I want them to come and speak to the n m women in the nation of Islam and ask them, where do you find this? 
in the nation of Islam. I, 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 I can't speak for some Pakistanis and the Pakistan culture, which comes down from an older Indian culture an Aryan culture within which you might find Daleks and or what's it called? The untouchables. Whereas the darker complexion you are, the more you are discriminated against within the society. I can't speak to that. I can't speak to Arab culture which is separate and distinct from Islam. Right. Arab culture where little girls would be buried in the sand because misogynistic men thought that girls were inferior. I can't speak to that. I can't speak to European Viking culture which coming from the hills and cave sides of Europe said that women were the temptress because according to the history when the caveman would go hunter gathering and he would leave her in the cave with the dog they had conjugal relationships this is according to their own history so he didn't trust her even with the dog, with Fido. And so when he would leave to go to war, he would put a metal girdle on her with a padlock, what they call a chastity belt. This is their history. Misogyny, blaming the woman for being the temptress and a, a, a creature who cannot be trusted. But now you want to mix all of that crap up with Islam. No. You need to read the Holy Quran. You need to study the history of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Who was a freer and a liberator of women who upheld the women on the highest standard, the highest level. And so, you know, beloved, I, you know, I'm, I, I feel very passionate about this because, see, we got to understand that Islam, which most of us knew nothing about when we were little children growing up, I never knew nothing about it. I was, and I wasn't looking for no Islam. I wasn't looking for Islam. I didn't think, oh, one day I'm going to grow up, I'm going to be this Muslim. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't on my radar at all. That was my mentality growing up. Islam found me. And Islam became my absolute Savior, I want you to hear me. This man, Master Farad Muhammad, what he brought us is an absolute, beautiful, saving grace. What he brought to planet Earth in that, see, we got to understand, beloved, that prior to Master Farad Muhammad, Islam was a dying thing on our planet. Because, because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he predicted three generations after me, you shall not be of me. He predicted the entire deviation of the Islamic Ummah and Muslims today are in deviation away from Prophet Muhammad all praise is due to Allah this is real Pakistani culture 
is what we take now to be Islam. Arab culture is what we think is Islam. Nothing to do with Islam. What Master Farad Muhammad brought is something so beautiful, so pristine, so precise, so accurate in its ability to reform both male and female, to rebuild broken families, to repair a universal order that's been thrown out of kilter, where the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said on one occasion, we live in a world that's upside down and inside out, where right is now wrong and wrong is now right. This is the reality of the world we live in. Where Muslims are now so ignorant. I want you to hear me. You can go to some Muslims now and convince them that blowing up innocent men, women and children is somehow justified in the Holy Quran. That is the height of ignorance and madness. But this is what we are led to believe is now accepted by some so-called Muslims. The idea of blowing up oneself and behind the idea apparently some notion that we will die and then go to heaven where we're going to meet 70 virgins. And if a man thinks he's going to meet 70 virgins, I'm assuming that he doesn't have any intention that they're going to remain virgins. So what kind of mentality are you running to heaven with? A mentality that says, I'm going to have an orgy deflowering virgins. You've got to be sick in your damn head. No, beloved. This is, a, this is all misunderstanding and misinterpretation of scripture and of uh, a particular history that has come down in terms of adith from the prophet. No, beloved. Almighty God Allah in the person of Master Farad Muhammad yes, came to reform Islam. Right. He came to renew Islam. He didn't come to dismantle what Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him put in place. He came to reestablish what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, put in place. Because the vast majority of Muslims today who claim the Prophet, calling themselves Sunni or Shia or Sufi or Hanbali, and so many, they say there are over 70 sects. But the Prophet taught one Islam. But now we've broken into over 70 different sects. And some of these arrogant, ignorant ones, they want to classify the nation of Islam as one of the sects now. We're one of these sects of Islam. No, 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 no. You're making a mistake. Master Farad Muhammad said, You are the nation of Islam he didn't say we were a nation of Islam he said you are the nation of Islam meaning when you say the the definite article there is only one nation of Islam and it was established or should I say re-established 1400 years ago. That's right. 